Hey, it's Mike here. Today I feel a need to respond to a very misguided video about the late actor Luke Perry who recently passed away. The video was done by anti-vegan meat dieter Frank Tofano, or as I like to call him, Frank Tofu No. And I think that's a fair name because he definitely doesn't like tofu. In particular, I will demonstrate how he misinterprets data to weave his way around to conclusions that are the opposite of the best data that we have. And really that the general thesis of his video that you should be afraid to go on a vegan diet because Luke Perry died of a stroke is completely unfounded. All right, let's go. A lot of people know Luke Perry from Beverly Hills 90210, but if you're a millennial like me, you may have seen him as the dad on Riverdale, and he recently, sadly, passed away much before his time of a stroke at age 53. And at that point, some of you even asked me to comment about his death, but I generally stay away from death-related topics, but Frank's video turned it into something very different, and quite a few of you reached out to me about that, and I was like, I don't need to talk about this, and then I actually watched the video and was like, yes, I do. And as one of you pointed out, people are clearly buying what he's selling based off the like to dislike ratio in some of the comments. From what we know, Luke Perry was following a predominantly plant-based diet. I know this is far from what's ideal for human health, and I can help people by sharing this message. I am ready to be helped. He was diagnosed with colon cancer in 2015, likely after being on a plant-based diet for about two years. All right, we're off to what I would consider a misleading start, especially around the term plant-based, which is a bit bendy and why I don't use it. But when the majority of people use plant-based or hear the word plant-based, they think vegan. And I could be wrong, but Frank is trying to paint him as a vegan or nearly vegan. But the reality is that Luke Perry was never vegan. He was never even vegetarian. Now he described himself as a meat and potatoes guy. He was raised on a standard American diet. And then after having a bout of colorectal cancer, he decided to clean up his diet a little bit. Uh, I've significantly cut down on the amount of red meat that I eat. I used to be like a, a steak and potatoes every yeah. night kind of guy. Now it's just for special occasions. He cut out red meats. He cut out red meats. Which meant lowering his red meat to occasionally. So he still ate red meat. He still appeared to eat other meats like chicken and he ate fish and he ate eggs and dairy products like butter and milk and cheese. At the very best, he was reducitarian. Now sit back in awe as Frank single-handedly debunks the connection between colorectal cancer and red meat. I find it odd that he is blaming the meat for his colon cancer issues when we know that most people consume a minimum of 70% of their calories from plant foods. I find it odd that Bob blamed his cigarettes for lung cancer. After all, he was inhaling 70% air. Let me continue to tell you how air causes cancer. And the idea that processed meat causes colon cancer doesn't stand up to epidemiology, let alone red meat. Open my eyes, Frank. I'm ready for the meat science. Eight cohort studies were included in the dose response analysis, which suggested that a 100 gram per day increase in red meat consumption was not associated with a significant increase in colorectal cancer risk. All right, I'm gonna have to rewind you a little bit and look at the same paragraph of that study that you are literally reading from right now, which says that, quote, positive associations were observed for colorectal cancer in case control studies for red meat and processed meat and cohort studies for red meat and processed meat with very solid p-values, very statistically significant, and roll back to the abstract and the findings of the reporting are, again, increased red meat and processed Processed meat means increased colorectal cancer. So what did Frank do? Well, he took a little snippet of a certain analysis, the dose dependent analysis of what levels correlate to what. That was looking at a smaller amount of studies and they just didn't find statistical significance. There was an increase, it just wasn't statistically significant. So he incorrectly took a lack of significance and extrapolated it to a negative conclusion. There was no conclusion there. So what he's saying is you should take the snippet of one type of analysis from one review that generally disagrees with his position over, for example, the entire World Health Organization who had 22 experts from 10 countries review more than 800 studies to reach their conclusions, which were red and processed meat are carcinogens. All right, let's move on to his views on fiber. He also increased his fiber intake, but there is no evidence that dietary fiber intake affects colon cancer rates. This study also shows high dietary fiber intake was not associated with a reduced risk of colorectal cancer. 
He starts by looking at a study on polyps, which are benign, but potentially precancerous. So not colorectal cancer itself, and also just a two to four year period, which can be limited for such a early stage. And again, it was a non-statistically significant finding, so he's drawing too much of a conclusion from findings that are limited. He then quotes this study, which is a step up because it's actually about colorectal cancer, but again, he happens to ignore a major finding of the study, a pattern here. In this large pooled analysis, dietary fiber intake was inversely associated with risk of colorectal cancer in age-adjusted analyses. So more fiber meant less cancer, and that was statistically significant. But he, of course, scrolls down to the part where they have adjusted away their statistical significance by adjusting for dietary factors and other factors, really doing an unknown amount of adjusting. And adjusting can be a great tool. It's a good part of science, but it means that these scientists created their own model. We don't know what they were adjusting. It was kind of looking into a black box. I don't have x-ray study vision, but it's very possible that they adjusted for something like red meat consumption. They could have actually taken the well-known knowledge of red meat causing cancer, processed meat causing cancer, and adjusting back for that. But that's a very complicated model to actually get correct. And it would be one thing to say if this was happening across the board with all the studies, fine. But it's not. To support the original finding of that study before it was adjusted, here is another newer study. And they found that for each 10 grams of fiber means 10% lower chance of getting colorectal cancer. And again, I'll just mention these are statistically significant findings. But let's look this issue right in the eye. How fiber consumption might affect colorectal cancer patients. What Luke Perry would have actually been concerned about. So from this 2017 study on actual colorectal cancer patients, quote, patients who increase their fiber intake after diagnosis from levels before diagnosis had a lower mortality and each five grams a day increase in intake was associated with 18% lower colorectal cancer specific mortality. Look at that p-value and 14% lower all-cause mortality. Again, 0 0.001. And I can help people by sharing this message. That's what Frank's arguing against. Saving lives one gram of fiber at a time five grams of fiber at a time. And another point from the study that's likely very triggering to meat dieters and Frank is that they found that cereal fibers, grain fibers, were particularly protective at a 33% lower risk for each five grams a day and also that lower mortality. It's crazy. And I wanna add that it's not just association. We also have a mechanism for why fiber can fight colorectal cancer. Here's Dr. Greger on the subject. Good bacteria in our gut take the fiber we eat and make short-chain fatty acids like butyrate that protect us from cancer. If you do nothing to colon cancer cells, they grow. That's what cancer does. But if you expose colon cancer cells to the concentration of butyrate our good bacteria make in our gut when we eat fiber, the growth is stopped in its tracks. Turn off the fiber, the cancer can resume its growth. So even if you have a genetic mutation that gets that cancer started, the butyrate from the fiber can actually prevent it from becoming more lethal. So the point here is that not every single study is gonna come to the exact same conclusion with different models of adjustment and different angles of analysis. The reality is that eating more fiber to prevent or help this disease is a really good bet with nothing to lose. Frank is wrong. Next, he really starts going off the rails connecting crazy dots about testosterone. Something really alarming about this is that Michael Clark Duncan actually suffered from a heart attack after adapting a vegetarian diet as well. But what is actually happening here? Low testosterone is known to be associated with an increased risk for heart attacks. And we know that a vegetarian diet can lower your testosterone. So we're gonna say it was the unsubstantiated lowering in testosterone that Michael Clark Duncan had going on a vegetarian diet. It wasn't the thousands of dollars that he used to spend on meat or how he changed his diet because he was so unhealthy. Here we see the Seventh-day Adventists, a predominantly vegetarian and vegan group with lower rates of testosterone as well as estrogen. We will specifically address that Adventist study in a bit, but first I will say sadly, while a vegetarian diet does lower your risk of developing heart disease, it doesn't necessarily reverse heart disease. There's only one diet that's been clinically shown to do that, a whole food vegan diet, and we'll cover that more in a second. But the massive detail that isn't being talked about here is that vegetarians still eat eggs, which is the main source of cholesterol in the US diet, and they eat even more dairy, which is the main source of saturated fat in the US diet. So he could have gone vegetarian and consumed more saturated fat than he did before. More likely the moderate increase in healthiness of his diet just wasn't enough to undo a lifetime of artery damage. 
It's unfortunate. And let's look right at the issues. In the title, Frank is clearly trying to attack vegans here. Well, from this study, vegans have higher levels of total testosterone and that could possibly act as a reserve as people age and testosterone would otherwise lower faster, who knows, and equivalent levels of free testosterone. So their active levels of testosterone are the same. And we need to examine Frank's sources again. Back to this study on the Adventist vegetarians. First of all, it was back in the 80s. Second of all, it only looked at 12 vegetarians. So do, do we want to say that vegetarians have a higher risk of heart disease because of a dozen vegetarians in the 80s having slightly lower levels of testosterone than 10 meat eaters did? And it really becomes laughable when we're looking at that exact population, the Adventist vegetarians in this study. You realize that they're the longest living population on earth. And about a fifth of those, again, are vegan. Meat plays a fundamental role in the health of every single human being. Yeah, and Meat's role is to roll you like that Smash Mouth song, which said, somebody once told me the world was gonna roll me, which actually means to be beaten and robbed, which is what Meat's gonna do. It's gonna hurt your body, and then it's gonna rob you of years of your life. Statistically. And yes, I just made a Smash Mouth reference, and I should probably take it out of the video, but I'm not. Of course, he has to talk about one of our favorite myths, how soy lowers testosterone. This may be because of legumes, especially soy, that can decrease testosterone and increase estrogen, especially in men. The best science on this topic appears to demonstrate that no, soy does not lower testosterone from this meta-analysis. From a bunch of studies, increased soy meant no change in hormones. And it's important to note that they actually took extracts, concentration of these phytoestrogens, which are not mammalian estrogens from soy, gave them to people, no change statistically significant as well. And can we just back up and trace how ridiculous of a path he took to support his conclusion to say that vegan diets equal strokes. He had to go Michael Clark Duncan's heart attack all the way over to slightly lower levels of testosterone in a dozen vegetarians in the 80s to lower testosterone equals heart disease, blah, 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 what? When the person we're talking about wasn't even vegan or vegetarian, no, tofu no, tofu no. But the most ironic part here and the most important point is that he's trying to say that a vegan diet puts you at risk of stroke when in fact it's the complete opposite to an unbelievable degree. A whole food vegan diet is the only diet that has been clinically demonstrated to stop heart attacks and strokes in their tracks. Looking to Dr. Esselstyn's study once again, he took 200 people with advanced cardiovascular disease who had had strokes and heart attacks previously, put them on a whole food vegan diet, and those that went off the diet had that 60% rate of adverse events like stroke. Those who stuck with the diet, 0.6%, 100 times less. It's like he was making a video where he was like, I am here to help people. Don't wear seatbelts because they might kill you in a car crash. Totally upside down. And I also need to mention the point of Luke Perry's smoking. Well, it didn't appear that he was smoking when he died in the past, like in the 90s, he was smoking allegedly three packs a day. Who really knows? From this study that looked at a ton of other studies, it appears that the risk for smokers is anywhere between one and a half times to six times the risk of stroke. And as the researchers titled it, the more you smoke, the more you stroke. And now for a bit of a tangent, Another Riverdale actor, Madeline Pesch, is actually vegan. And here she is bantering with Gordon Ramsay, who is like pretending to cook her a vegan meal on the show when he didn't. It was kind of weird. But we should be worried. Being vegan could put her at a risk of being dangerously good looking. I'm kidding. No, no. If Frank was actually going to do it, he would be like, as you can see, her hair is red. And from this study of five people in the 80s, redheads have lower levels of iron because it goes to their hair. So being vegan puts her at an increased risk of getting anemia through her red hair and she will die. Red hair plays a fundamental role in killing vegans. A couple final points. He tries to point to soy as promoting hypothyroidism and then there's a hypothyroidism connection with cardiovascular disease. And the reality is that vegans have lower levels of hypothyroidism. If you wanted to get a heart attack, hypothyroidism is literally the best way to do it. You're increasing your blood pressure, pushing more LDL particles through the arterial wall. And he specifically points to those risk factors that vegans have. They have lower LDL, bad cholesterol. They have lower levels of hypertension and so forth. Again, he's gone roundabout AF to come to the exact opposite conclusion. Then he talks about B12 and I'll try and keep this short, but he tries to fear monger here saying that, oh, you might have the 
MTHFR gene and therefore you might have to get injections and oral supplements won't work for you. Firstly, thankfully, apparently B12 deficiency rates appear to be equalizing. At least they were the same between omnivores and vegans in this study. And looking at the MTHFR gene, you can just take methylcobalamin, which is methylated orally. There's no reason to believe that won't work. To sum it up and hit on the main points, the reality here is that yes, red and processed meats do cause colorectal cancer. The data are very clear on that. And fiber decreases the risk of colorectal cancer, especially the risk of dying of it if you already have it, which is huge. And no, vegans don't have lower levels of testosterone, but they do have lower levels of hypertension, that high blood pressure, levels of LDL or bad cholesterol, and hypothyroidism also lower. And a whole food vegan diet appears to be the most promising intervention at reversing cardiovascular disease, opening up arteries, and preventing strokes. Finally, Luke Perry was never vegan. He was never vegetarian. His untimely death has nothing to do with a vegan diet. Frankly, no pun intended, you don't need to use people's deaths to poo-poo veganism. So I'd ask Frank to maybe consider that you're not coming to the best conclusions based off the research that you're looking at. A meat-based diet, which has virtually no studies on it, is not actually helping people, telling them to eat less fiber and that red meat and processed meat is okay, is not helping people. And let me know what you think down below about all this. Feel free to like, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video.